ladies and gentlemen, good evening everyone. Uh, my name is David Riles and I'm the president of the Plymouth Athenaeum. And thank you for joining us as we hold the fifth and last of the lectures in our spring series here at the home of our partners, the City College Plymouth. This evening, Professor Willie Wilson discusses astrobiology from a marine virologist's perspective on viruses in space and poses a philosophical question if viruses are instrumental for the evolution of life on Earth, then why not on other planets? Professor Wilson, who is a marine virolog virologist, I knew I'd have trouble with that one, <laughs> specializing in algal viruses, is a director of the Marine Biological Association, the MBA, a learned society of scientists and members of, in, with members in 35 countries and across five continents. Willie's personal research interests focus on the multiple roles of marine viruses, which he describes as lubricants on the, of the great engines of planetary control. He brings expertise in revealing the interactions between viruses and phytoplankton, with an emphasis on understanding the genetic basis of virus infections and their ecological and evolutionary consequences for ocean life. In short, why viruses are essential for life as we know it. If you're joining us online, we would ask again that you please remain muted throughout and also ask you to note that as this lecture is being recorded, please turn off your camera if you don't wish to be seen. Um, Willie is happy to take questions uh, throughout the lecture, uh, but there are some videos uh, he'll be showing, so not during those, please, but um, I'm sure we'll all have some questions anyway at the end of the lecture. Um, and if you're joining us online, please, as usual, send any questions through the chat function. Now, I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming Willie this evening. Over to you, Willie. Thank you. Uh, I truly appreciate the, uh, the invite, uh, and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure for me to uh, talk about viruses, as, as you will hopefully uh, discover uh, through the course of this next uh, hour. Now, I also realize we've got, uh, it's a hybrid, uh, which is always difficult. Uh, we were going through all the technical stuff earlier, and I know it's been done slightly differently uh, tonight, so you're just getting recorded and watching the big screen, and hopefully you'll hear uh, the videos uh, as they come through, and hopefully I can sort of figure out how to get it all. It, it, it's a little bit clunky in places, but don't worry about that. So uh, I thought I would just start with just one or two slides just to tell you a little bit about the Marine Biological Association and director of the Marine Biological Association started there as director uh, four years ago, uh, but I was a, a fellow uh, at the uh, research fellow at the Marine Biological Association um, over 20 years ago, to, uh, 1998, I think I started. Uh, but I've been in lots of other places and then eventually come back to my dream job as director of the Marine Biological Association. So, uh, and we've got a brief, very brief introduction to the Marine Biological Association. For those of you based in Plymouth, it's the old aquarium that's uh, uh, in front of the Royal Citadel. And that is the kind of what I like to call the global headquarters of the association. The, at the site itself, it uh, has a whole range of facilities for conducting marine biology uh, research. And I never know what we is. So I'll look at I've got two screens. I'll look at, uh, I'll look at this screen because it's a bit bigger. Um, but it, its origins go a way back, not quite as far back as Athenaeum Society, I, I sort of realized. Um, and the, the foundation was um, a way back to the book was known as the great fisheries debate of the 1880s. If you Google that, there was nothing on there, actually. We were talking about this the other week there, about, uh, I, I gave a talk talking about the great fisheries debate, and everybody just Googles it, and so well, there was nothing on Google, so it couldn't have happened. 
Uh, but sure enough, that was at the foundation of the Marine Biological Association. Of course, there was two schools of thought. There was um, Thomas Henry Huxley, uh, Darwin's bulldog, um, who's, uh, who, who felt there was no need for fishing restrictions. Uh, there should be no concern over uh, fish stocks. Uh, but of course, the, there was a, a, an opposing view because of the mechanization of the fishing industry that sooner or later you start uh, pillaging the, the, the ocean more and more, uh, it's, it's going to become a problem. Um, and that was um, so Edwin Ray Lancaster's uh, viewpoint. And he had concerns over fisheries impacts. Uh, long story short, there was a suggestion for a new society to investigate this and actually provide evidence to uh, government. So it's research based evidence. Uh, to advise government on how to manage uh, the ocean. And to this day, that is what our mission is, is about. Now, you don't need to read all of this. This is what, uh, when I got in invited. Um, it was the, the, the invite actually made me really embarrassed because uh, the, I think you were basically saying, uh, look, you have this long association with the Marine Biological Association. And uh, so if I point to the, 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 I guess, the fourth bullet point, the first nine directors of the MBA were all members. So why aren't you a member? So, uh, so I suspect at the end of the night, I'm going to be getting uh, tapped on the shoulder and asked to be, uh, asked to be a member. Um, and of course, it'd be a pleasure to after finding out all about it. So uh, I, I will, of course, uh, become a member. But... Um, Anyway, I'm just going to, this is just a very, it's a very short video that really explains the, the, phys, the facility. So if you come in through the door of that wonderful old iconic building that sits out looking out over uh, Plymouth Sound, uh, this is what you see inside and hopefully this works. <laughs> from sort of fairly basic rocky shore ecology where uh, we're going out doing long-term studies where you can just do anything from counting barnacles uh, through to really world-class cutting-edge molecular biology imaging facilities that are actually at the site at the moment. And right now we're going through a, a five million pound refurbishment. It's a bit of a building site at the moment. And noise of jackhammers is... Um, uh, not as, as great as it could be, really, but we, we see the end picture, which is uh, by the end of the year, we should have so even better uh, facilities there. And given that you're probably going to ask me to be a member of the Athenaeum Society, I'll put our own advert in. It is a membership organization, it is a learning, it's set up as a learning society. Um, uh, and we are sort of vision is to be the, the, the voice of uh, marine biology. So you know, all, you're always welcome to sort of come in and look at our website and, and become members if you want to learn a lot more about marine biology. Okay, so get on to the talk. Um, it's it's a bit of a it, it's a bit of an unusual one, uh, astrobiology. Um, and I was. Uh, 
I guess I, I think in, in the chat just before the talk there, I, I, I've given a version of this talk last year where I was invited to give uh, a talk on astrobiology uh, by the Royal Astronomical uh, Society. And uh, I did, uh, like any self-respecting scientist does, I sort of Googled astrobiology to actually find out what it was uh, about being, you know, viruses in, in, in space. Are there viruses in space? Um, uh, it turns out I am actually a, an astrobiologist as, uh, when I looked at the definitions of it. But I'm going to ruin the talk for you now because I'm going to give you the punchline. Uh, the punchline is... Nobody's found viruses in space, so uh, it's, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one, but the whole area of astrobiology and astrobiology is really about asking the question, is there life out there? Um, but actually, it's much more fundamental than that. It's about asking the question, what is life out there? Okay. And... And I'm not going to get religious, uh, or, or just 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 so you know, uh, it's, it's it's sort of really taking a, a sort of very focused scientific look. Um, and then, and I guess my journey really started a way back, probably about 12 years ago, when I was working in the, the U.S. and I got invited by NASA to a workshop where they were asking exactly that question. Now NASA are sending. Uh, probes into space and to sort of various planets and they were just asking the question well would we know life if we if we found it how what, what is life even going to look like in these planets the reason i was asked along is because as a uh, a virologist uh, and a marine biologist uh i was going to make a case of well if you're going to look for life you need to look for viruses and signatures of viruses and what I'm going to try and convince you of during this talk, that without viruses, you will not have any kind of life at all, because viruses are pervasive in all forms of life on this planet. Now, what I'm also going to do is kind of flip the argument around a little bit and just say, you know, if, if you were... If, if you were living on a, one of these Goldilocks zone planets, the Goldilocks zone planet is one of these planets that's hundreds of millions of light years away that the Goldilocks is, is, uh, is just right. It's, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right. And it's probably a planet very similar to, or what well, we would argue that it's very similar to planet Earth, that there is life there, perhaps an intelligent life. And they've been sending probes out um, for hundreds of millions of years trying to find life in other planets. And all of a sudden, a probe comes into our atmosphere, into planet Earth. And the first thing they're going to do is say, OK, I'm, I'm going to send my little test tube down. Uh, and I'm going to take a sample, so screw it up, and I'm going to analyze that sample. Now, chances are, if they did that, uh, they would land in the middle of the ocean, because three quarters of the planet is ocean. Uh, so they would probably take a sample of seawater from the surface of the seawater because they don't have a lot of room in these, you know, rockets that have come for hundreds of millions of years. Um, and when they analyze that, what they would find is viruses, microbes, maybe a few microbes, but mostly viruses. Uh, and so their conclusion would be, well, life is viruses. So that's really the, the kind of hypothesis, the theory, the uh, I guess the thesis of the, the 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 whole talk, and I'm just going to sort of walk through this and maybe try and convince you of why, well, one, why are viruses so important for life on this planet, uh, and why do we even find so many of them in the ocean? You know, when I first started my PhD thirty odd years ago, um, viruses were only just discovered in the ocean. So thirty years ago. People didn't even realize there was viruses in there. Now we know they're fundamentally important, pervasive throughout all life. So what is a virus? One of the great things, one of the few great things about the coronavirus pandemic is I don't need to explain what a virus is anymore when I give a talk. I usually spend 10, 15, 20 minutes explaining what a virus is. But of course, 
we all know the impact <laughs> this one virus, well, it'll be multiple strains and everything, from a virologist's point of view, it's been phenomenally interesting. But just look at the planetary effect that virus has had in terms of socioeconomics, in terms of health, in terms of how we actually, the, the research, the speed of research that's gone into actually try and get around its defense mechanisms. It's, it's been pretty phenomenal in such a short period of time. Uh, and it's all caused by what is actually, in the whole scheme of things, a pretty insignificant virus uh, when we look at life on this planet. Um, because remember, as human beings, we're only, you know, we're, <laughs> In evolutionary terms, we're sort of right at the end. We're sort of one of the, the newest beings on this planet. There is so much other life on there that also has uh, viruses. It's going to be there long after human beings have, have gone. I don't want to be all negative about it. I want to try and convince you that viruses are a good thing. So what is a virus? Um, very simple, really. It is, it is an incredibly uh, simple biological entity it is a piece of nucleic acid wrapped in some protein, sometimes a little bit of lipid to the fat. But they're incredibly intelligent in terms of how they propagate themselves. And there's a whole spectrum of how, that I, I can give a whole series of lectures on what, what this I, I'm going to describe in this slide. You get viruses that infect a cell, hijack the host replication machinery, produce multiple copies of the cell, kill the cell, and go on and kill, and, and go on and infect lots of other cells. And that, and they spread really, really fast. They're incredibly efficient. You get chronic type infections, where you get a virus that'll uh, infect a cell. It won't actually kill it, but it'll make the cell, it'll change how the cell feels. Can you imagine as a human being, if you have a viral infection, you have that chronic infection, you can't get rid of it, but it stays, it stays with you. You also get uh, a form, I think, which I think are probably the, the smartest of the lot, where you get latent infections, where you get, when it, a, a virus infects that uh, a, a cell, it incorporates itself into the genome and then just remains latent. And then just waits until the timing is right uh, to, so that it can propagate itself. Now, a good example of that is something like a, a herpes virus, the ones that give you cold sores. So when you're immunocompromised, that's when you, you end up getting a cold sore. Um, and these are uh, what's termed you know, persistent infections. They're with us all the time. We are full of viruses. Our genomes, our genetic makeup, is riddled with virus sequences. And met to this day, medical science doesn't really know what they all do. Um, but it's not just the same, but it, it, it's, it's not just with humans, it's with all life. Whenever we go out, we, we're involved in a project right now, a Darwin Tree of Life project, where we're uh, basically deciphering the, the genetic blueprint of every single organism in the United Kingdom. Quite a grand challenge in itself. One of the things I'm interested in, everybody said, well, what's the sequence of this, you know, fish? And I'm there going, I wonder how many viruses it's got uh, and, and what, what types of viruses it's got. So, and one of the things that we're finding is that we are full of viruses. And if you sort of look at the medical science behind it, you know, we, we have a whole, uh, you know, we have a whole microbiome and now that whole microbiome, which you probably heard a lot about, we, each of us have about a kilo of microbes in our, in our bodies. The medical science is now realizing that they, they play a huge part in, uh, the, uh, in, in how the, 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 the whole health of a human being. But there's also viruses that are infecting all these and playing a, a, a massive part in that. We're learning more and more about that. So anyway, there's the, I could go on about lots of different examples, but I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not going to do that. Okay, let's get into real space viruses. So th this was part of a, a project I was involved with 
sort of developing comic books for uh, to try and uh, figure out if viruses were the, the, the heroes or the villains. Of course, being me, I was only making the hero. Uh, and this was, uh, we, we, we had this whole monster, which was uh, marine algae. Uh, and at the time, there, were, there was a lot of problems with harmful algal blooms. Uh, so we thought, right, this is perfect. We can sort of say that uh, we've got viruses that will kill these harmful algal blooms. So that means the virus is the hero. Uh, and so the hero is this sort of hunky looking guy who is uh, the, the superhero virus. This is a job for EHV, now being a geek in terms of virus, EHV is a Mila and a Huxley virus, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in just a second. Um, and, uh, and of course, the, 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 the superhero. You know, he's saying there, okay, just because I'm a virus doesn't mean you've got to make that awful gross out face. I am one of the good guys, a real life aquatic superhero. And so we were trying to make viruses cool and sort of saying, well, they're the ones that defeat the algae. And I wasn't particularly comfortable with that whole storyline because algae are quite good in the whole scheme of things because they fix carbon dioxide and the start of the, the oceanic food chain. So, uh, but but we go on and explain this in the comic book, um, you know, that the, these viruses possess superpowers and combat the, the growing mess, menace, these algae restoring the ocean to its natural balance. And that was the point that we were trying to make, that the viruses weren't there just to kill everything. It was there, you need a loss process in a biological system. You also need a process for transferring genetic material, which are the two main roles of uh, viruses in, in any in a natural ecosystem. So now we're getting a proper space. Um, so I've kind of shamelessly stolen this uh, image from NASA. Well, I did, they did ask me to uh, go to the workshop. And of course, these are, you know, a uh, view through one of the telescopes. Um, and you can see, you know, just hundreds of galaxies that are that are out there in our in our universe. So great, this is tons of images like this that you can find. And you can go from that astronomical scale. And I remember looking at this and thinking, you know, these guys are spending hundreds of billions of dollars creating images like this. And for about 10 quid, I can create pretty much the same image with viruses. And it looks pretty much the same. And actually what we've got here, and going from astronomical scale to my micro scale, uh, and this is me taking a tiny drop of seawater and adding a, a dye in it that attaches to nucleic acids and it fluoresces green. You look at it down a microscope, it looks like this. And actually all these tiny little stars that you see are viruses. And I guess the galaxies that you can see are bacteria, are probably very small protists, fungi, tiny phytoplankton. Um, and the first thing you notice in this, that I could I could take this from Plymouth Sound, and it would look exactly like this. And the first thing you notice is that there's at least ten times more viruses than there is everything else. And there's some pretty astronomical numbers that are associated with this. If I go out to Plymouth Sound right now, or anywhere in the ocean really, on average there's going to be a million to a hundred million viruses in a teaspoon of seawater. Now just think about that, that's, that's a lot of viruses. Now it, I'm not saying Plymouth Sound's contaminated and it's really bad and if you jump in there you're going to get sort of dissolved in seconds by a massive virus infection. There's a part of the natural ecosystem. And you can do some fun things with the numbers here. Um, if you were to, you know, do back of the envelope uh, calculations, so it's probably in the region of 10 to the 31, and we have some viruses in the room, but this sounds the thing. 10 to the 31 viruses in the ocean. That's a lot, that's a big number. Um, we have around Avogadro's number, which is 10 to the 23 infections every second going on in the ocean. That is a huge amount of infectious activity. 
Now, if you were to weigh the viruses, I don't know how you go about weighing them, but if you were to weigh the viruses, they'd be equal to the weight of around 75 million blue whales. Now, in the ocean right now, there's less than 10,000 blue whales. So that's a huge biomass of carbon that's in the ocean uh, through viruses. And if you put them end to end, again, I have no idea why you would take all the viruses and put them end to end. But if you did that, then each virus is about 100 nanometers in length on average, uh, they would reach around 42 million light years. Now, if you consider that our own galaxy is around 100,000 light years across, uh, you, you're sort of looking at this, the, all these viruses stretching anywhere uh, between you know, 40 to 60 uh, galaxies uh, away from us. So there's a huge number. So that, the point is, there's an astronomical amount of viruses out there. Um, but the key point is, if there's that many viruses out there, and the ocean is, well, you know, take pollution aside, climate change, all, all, all these kind of things, and overfishing and all the rest of it. There's a huge amount of life in the ocean. Massive amount of life in there. Yeah, there's all these viruses. And we know the more we find out about viruses, the more we realize just how necessary they are for life. When it was first discovered, there was all these viruses there. Everybody was, I was quite lucky. I got into it right at the start of my PhD. And we, re we thought, well, if there's all these viruses there, they must be doing something that's kind of useful, okay? You know, and, and sometimes, you know, if you've just had a virus, in fact, you just had that case of COVID or the flu, or you've just had your brain dissolved by an Ebola infection, you're not gonna to wanna to hear this good news story, really, are you? Um, but fundamentally, at a planetary level, viruses are critical for life on this planet. So who are they infecting? These this will be one of the things at MVA, we love getting great images of the, the sort of microbial uh, plants and animals that are out there. And there's a, a, our plankton team who put this image together. There's a whole range of um, uh, microscopic plants and animals. Um, and there's you know things like the, the chain way over here. This is a type of plants covered in silica, and there's lots of different, uh, I, I guess, which could be aliens, really. And actually, that's a good segue to the film Alien. Um, the, 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 the actual alien itself that they use, and quite often a lot of these monster movies and horror movies, they'll use plankton. You, you sort of take something that, you know, looks like, oh, I've lost it now. Oh, I had it in my title slide, which just looks, if you, if you actually sort of look at them close up, they just look horrific things, but they're just geared up for uh, eating, the, eating other things, really. So at, at a microbial level, it's, uh, it's quite vicious. Um, but anyway, that's, that's who the viruses are affecting. And you go out into the ocean now and take a great big net, uh, plankton net, Scoop it up. There's tons and tons of plankton there. And if I decipher the genetic material, you guarantee you'd find tons of viruses in there. Those viruses are ensuring that the, uh, the, the natural balance within the, the organisms are right. And when the time is right and, and they, they end up dying, uh, that sort of helps speed up the process. And you get this kind of microbial loop processes that ensure that all that is recycled in a, a sort of natural way. Uh, when you sort of, you know, just to get a sense of scale, this is a, a plant, uh, a sort of a, a mi microbial plant, if you like, something called the Meliana huxleyi on the, uh, a, a pinhead here. And if, for, you know, it, some people might realize a deliberate mistake that I've made here because a pinhead is actually 75 uh, microns uh, across, and this is only a five micron cell, so there really should be 15 of these cells. I don't know if anybody picked up on that one. But anyway, 
Um, and actually trying to get a single cell on a pinhead and take a photo. That was, that was almost like Photoshop. Um, but here, you know, is the more academic image. Uh, when we sort of look at uh, food webs, I'm sure everybody's sort of seen images of food webs. Um, the, the vast majority of the food web is microbial. Fish are way out here somewhere. Uh, everything from, you know, the, 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 the animals and the plants and the bacteria account for more than 90% of the biomass. And viruses are infecting all of these. We always find viruses. I know if I went out into Plymouth Sound tomorrow and took a sample of water, I would find a virus that has never been seen before in science. Okay, and I, I could go out every single day, in fact, and we're going to show you an example of when we've done exactly that. Um, and this is where they live. I love showing this image. This is planet Earth. I don't know why it's called planet Earth. It should be planet ocean. That's the Pacific Rim. 75% uh, of our planet is ocean. And if you look... Uh, I, I quite often use this quote, the illuminated region of the ocean is only a small part of the 3.7 kilometer mean depth, yet it houses several of the great engines of planetary control. Two of these engines are the absorption of heat energy, which drives all your physical processes, it drives the weather patterns, and then there's the absorption of light energy, which starts the whole photosynthetic process. Uh, so through photosynthesis, all your microbial plants are absorbing carbon dioxide, creating oxygen, generating uh, lipids and proteins that drive the rest of the, the oceanic food web. All life in the ocean starts from the absorption of sunlight. Okay. And Part of that whole process is in terms of evolution, and the evolutionary processes are driven by changes in genes, genetic material, and that is driven by viruses infecting cells and taking genes and moving them around. So they're critical for the evolution of life. Uh, they're also critical for it's the killing cells, which everybody thinks is a bad thing, but actually that releases organic material, uh, which is then what's called remineralized. It's like a compost heap. Right? You, you throw a load of cabbage that you don't like in a compost heap, and lo and behold, a year later, it turns into this beautiful mulch soil that you can put back in your garden. Exactly the same is happening in the ocean. Viruses will be instrumental to a lot of the lost, lost processes that are happening there. Quite simply, viruses are, you might have heard this before already tonight, the lubricants of the great engines of planetary control. And that is why I think that if you're going to be sending probes out to different planets, then you've got a tiny sampling vessel, you should be looking for biases. So at this point, I'm going to take a break and show you another video. Uh, and what we're going to do, so when, I'm going to talk a little bit about the research that we do. And you're going to, in the video, you're going to hear a lot of what I've just been pontificating about uh, again, but slightly more interesting me, perhaps. Um, but part of the research that I've been doing for probably the last 20, 25 years uh, if, if you're going to make all these assertions about viruses, uh, you need to find model organisms to work on and base all your theories on. And we're working with something called Miliana Huxleyi, EHUX. Uh, it's a globally important marine microalgae. You can see these things blooming from space. They have hundreds, thousands of square kilometers in area in the space, uh, in, in, in the area. Um, uh, And long story short, we found uh, we were able to isolate a range of viruses that infected it, and we were able to sort of develop a model system.
to work with. Uh, and this, uh, what, what I'm going to do now, this is where it gets a little bit funky, because uh, I'm going to come out of the, uh, the, the talk and I'm going to put a podcast on. And now, the, the one thing I'll say is the podcast was done professionally. Uh, it was done by uh, uh, a, a radio company, production company in the US called uh, Radio Lab. Uh, the slides that you see were done by me, uh, non professionally. So <laughs> forgive the slides. Um, although the animation you'll see in the middle of it was done professionally, that was done by somebody who knows what they're doing with animations. Um, and hopefully it all works. So I'll stop talking. And. If I can, it takes about five minutes or so. Uh, so I press escape here. The next thing you'll hear is the podcast. Or you go at filmcheck.org. Thanks. Bye. And this message. Wait, wait, you're listening. <laughs> you're listening to Radio Lab. Radio Lab. I just found out the way. From I'm Robert Pilowich. This is Radio Lab Podcast. And today we're going to talk about global warfare. Back across the planet on a scale that's really hard to believe, involving trillions of deaths. And yet, we really need this war because without it, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here, Jack wouldn't be here, and you may have noticed he isn't here, and it's not because of a war, it's because he had a baby, but before Jack went on paternity leave, we sat down with Ari Daniel Shapiro. Okay. And he told us the story. Here it comes. Right. Yeah, so here we are at the, the Center for the Culture of Believe the Final Fight. This is Willie. And I always say Willie Wilson. Willie Wilson is his name? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. tough. Just like his grandfather, actually. My dad, Willie Wilson. The, Long line of William Wilson. <laughs> Your son? My son is Angus, but he's Angus William Wilson. So. <laughs> okay. Willie works at the Bigelow Laboratory for Ocean Sciences in Maine. Okay. And he studies these tiny plant like creatures that live in the sea called phytoplankton. He keeps them in a fridge in these little test tubes, half full of kind of the greenish water. He pulled one out and showed it to me. And it doesn't really look like there's that much going on in there. But actually, right at the bottom, you can see what looks like a... Like a white... Or a goo. What is it? It's the carnage of war. Huh? In that test tube that Willie's holding are millions of tiny single-celled plants called coccolithophores. Coccolithophores. Yeah. And there are lots of them in the sea. There's probably about 100,000 of these coccolithophores in a teaspoon of seawater. Tell me about the coccolithophores. Like, what do they look like? They're basically like, uh, the, like tiny little translucent balls with you know, a slight tinge of green. But the key thing is that... On the outside of that ball, it has these white plates. Tiny circular shields of chalk. Because the coccolithophores are fighting for their lives. Fighting with whom? Each other? Viruses. These viruses that are shaped like diamonds. So here's what happens. Imagine you're a coccolithophore, floating in the ocean, and along comes this diamond-shaped virus. And it jams its diamond tip into you. Between these plates, and absolutely get inside the cell. The chinks in the armor. That's right, it's like the chinks in the armor. And the coccolithophore just engulfs it. And the virus thinks, yes, I'm in here. And then it sort of makes straight to the nucleus. And it's at that moment that the viral takeover begins. The virus kind of hijacks the cellular machinery that's usually used by the coccolithophore to make more coccolithophore stuff and it starts making more viruses. So inside the cockroach for now, there are these little diamonds multiplying. Yeah, they're filling up that space. And eventually, all these viruses head out of the cockroach for. In big belches, or? Like a steady stream of viruses. 
And each one of these viruses has the ability to, to go on and infect another coccolithophore cell. In fact, those coccolithophores in that test tube that Willie showed me, I shake this stuff to the bottom a little bit. Those were in the process of dying. Smell that. Yeah, so that, what you're smelling there, that's that, that's the infection. That's dimethyl sulfate you smell. So the infection is already occurring in this culture. And when the coccolithophore dies, those white shields kind of fall off the cell. They sort of gradually sort of rain off over the course of the infection. So as it's dying, after it's spewed out these viruses, it just sheds its plate. And then it kind of, <coughs> and then it dies. Yeah, and that creates this white chalkiness. Yeah. So this means like the coccolithophores are not doing very well. Well, they've got a couple of tricks up their little calcified sleeves. Sometimes when a virus enters, the coccolithophore will send out a chemical signal. They're so shouting, hey, it's too late for me. But save yourselves. And initially, this signal is pretty weak in the water. But as more and more coccolithophores are infected, the chorus of this chemical beacon grows louder and louder. And so the other cells, they hear these messages. And they change by messing with their DNA a bit. And they go from having those white shields on the outside to having these jaggedy scales. Which we think might be impenetrable. Scales instead of these plates. That's right, yeah, yeah, that's right. Why aren't they just scaly all the time? Because when they're scaly, they can't be the best couple of the force they can be. <laughs> they just don't grow as well. So scaly is an adaptation against the virus. Exactly. And then finally, if all else fails, program cell death. The coccolithophores just commit suicide. It just shuts down and kills itself to prevent propagation of viruses. But over time, the viruses have figured out how to prevent the cell from killing itself. So it delays the death of the coccolithophore for as long as possible to maximize the number of viruses that can get out. Wow, this is serious. Yeah. It's like an arms race. There's a constant battle to, to be fitter than you were several generations ago. And without... Here's the crazy thing. This battle is happening all through the surface of the ocean. There are legions of coccolithophores dying all the time. And the coccolithophores are shedding their white shields. It's like taking millions of tiny little mirrors and putting them in the surface of the ocean. So many that you can actually see this carnage from space. You can see this from space. They're almost the whole of the, the North Atlantic. And you get this sort of milky bloom that covers anything from, you know, off the, the west coast of Scotland and the southern Iceland almost all the way to Newfoundland. Um, and the southern hemisphere, you get this sort of massive milkiness that sort of navigates the, the globe. These vast swirls of milky water curling around islands and continents. And that's all carnage from this battle. Billions and billions of soldiers that have fallen in the field that we can view from space. It probably is trillions if you're talking on that scale. Yeah, I think it's yeah. quadrillions. Quadrillion? You think, you think it's more than the quadrillions? Just say it, see how it feels. There are quadrillions of soldiers dying. <laughs> how does that feel? It felt good. <laughs> if I were to be an astronaut, how often would I see these sorts of blooms? All the time, somewhere on the planet. Every day, every hour? Every day, every hour. There's, there's going to be a bloom going on somewhere. You know, a, a good example is of the Norwegian fjords. They start in the fjords and late April into May time and then they sort of creep out of the fjords like this huge living uh, amoeba. Fishermen hate it because the fish can't see the, the lures so they can't catch the fish anymore. And as the shields rain off and fall down to the ocean floor, they build up and build up over time. Millions of years of uh, sedimentation of these sort of chalk particles. That's actually what led to the creation of the Cliffs of Dover, the White Cliffs of Dover in England. Shut up, really? Yes, this is of geology in action. And not just that, when the coccolithophores get decimated by the virus, 
it kind of clears out the ocean for other phytoplankton to bloom. And then they get mowed down by their viruses. And then the coccolithophores might bloom again, and then they get wiped out. And this cycle. With all these battles, I mean, it's all responsible for about half the, the oxygen that we breathe. Really? Half the oxygen we breathe? Half the oxygen. Because when the phytoplankton bloom, they take in carbon dioxide and they release a puff of oxygen. And then they're cut down by these viruses, but they grow back up again. And another breath is released. So the whole system is is just kind of breathing. People think of the, the lungs of the planet, uh, uh, the, the rainforests, and that's, that's kind of half the picture, but every other breath we take comes from the, the phytoplankton of the ocean that are going through these battles on a, you know, on a daily basis. So this is a battle that rages every single day, somewhere in, in our oceans. Yeah, we need the battle to live. So hopefully, if you haven't fallen asleep after the, after the last little bit there, um, it gives you a sense of the planetary influence that viruses have. And you can see then how this could translate to different planets, similar process. If they're life in different planets, you're going to get similar types of processes. And what I'm trying to do here is really uh, convince you that an inf a virus infection isn't just about you getting a flu. And it's, it's a really bad, it's a bad thing if you get the flu right now. But on a planetary scale, it's critical for all life on any planet, certainly our planet. And if I try and flip this around a little bit, we've got a couple of slides here from a good friend and colleague of mine, Ken Stedman, who is probably a real astrobiologist, astrobiologist, because the whole discipline of astrobiology or virology uh, really started with people working in extreme environments. And Ken does a huge amount of work uh, looking at um, viruses in a whole range of really extreme environments. This is him sent back these slides. Uh, th this is him so, uh, with his test tube at uh, Rabbit Creek and the Yellowstone National Park, where they have, you know, it's a really hot water. It was up to, you know, boiling point in places. They've got really uh, acrid uh, conditions, really low pH, and which is kind of the conditions you would expect to find in, in, in other planets, where there's really sort of real extreme uh, conditions. Uh, yet there is life in there. There is a group of bacteria-like organisms called archaea, the most ancient form of life on this planet. If you do evolutionary trees and taxonomy, you find they're the very earliest forms of life. And they have viruses that infect them as well. And one of the things that Ken is trying to do is actually trying to look for signatures of these viruses, looking for virus fossils. Now, they've never found any yet, but one of the things he has found, I mean, there's all sorts of weird and wonderful viruses, got lots of different shapes that, the, that they find, that worked out the structure of them. But they, these viruses actually cover themselves in silica, uh, you know, which is glass, basically, uh, which allows them to survive or remain viable in these conditions. Uh, and so a lot of the research that's going on in Ken's group is really trying to sort of figure out ways to find what these biosignatures are. Um, and that's really the essence of what astrobiology is, is about, to sort of look at extreme environments. In many ways, the ocean 
is an extreme environment. You go to the bottom of the ocean with the pressure that you find at the bottom of the Mariana Trench, for example, uh, where you have the black smokers and that, it is abundant with uh, life. And these are probably the kinds of conditions you're going to find in some of the fringe, maybe not so the Goldilocks zone planets, but certainly some of the fringe planets. So it's possible there's life there. So if we were going to send this probe out to one of these planets, Europa or something like that, so we're a little bit closer, um, we might, we, we should be looking for viruses. Now, that's what I tried to persuade NASA to do. Uh, and we wrote various proposals. They didn't fund us to do it because I think they were looking for, I mean, there's a whole story around inorganic life, which is a whole other, that's not crazy. It's an interesting theory, but it's based, life based around silicon. So I'm going to kind of bring out, I was going to talk a little bit about how, how we would go about um, detecting viruses, but it gets, starts getting really geeky, actually. Oh, it's not going to let me move on. But it's just some of the work that we've been doing uh, where, where we can actually, oh, I'm going way past there. Um, you know, I, I said if I went out to Plymouth Sound right now and uh, took a, a, my little jam jar of water, I, I, I could go out and find a whole ton of novel viruses. This is a, a whole process where I've got a pipeline where you can take some water, you pass them through a laser and sort them out, uh, single viruses, one virus at a time, and you can work out the genetic information. And every time we do that, and you sort of do a taxonomic list, we've got, I won't go into the methods for doing it, but that word at the start there, novel, these are, the, and these are the, the taxonomic groups that they belong to. They're all novel. They've never been seen in science before. You look at the genetic makeup of them. It's th these are genes that have never, we have no idea what they do. So there's one argument that says, why should we be <laughs> spending millions going out to space trying to find life? And we don't even know what the life is in their own backyard as well. So. So I shall finish it there. This is a, a basically just going on about what I've, I've talked about. But what do I mean by astrobiology? It's the astronomical statistics is, you know, if anything, uh, about life on planet Earth and the role that viruses play. We need viruses for life. Wherever life exists, viruses are found in abundance. Um, they thrive in extreme environments that you would find in some of these planets. Um, I would have talked a little bit more about it at the end there, is a lot of the research is really sort of developing the tools for detecting biosignatures. A lot of the research in my own group um, was always focused on developing these tools uh, so that we could work with the likes of NASA, European Space Agency, uh, go up uh, and, and actually try and send a probe somewhere uh, so that we can actually try and sort of figure out if there are viruses in different planets. The viruses are the true extraterrestrials uh, to lubricate planetary engines. And that's where I'll stop, I think. Thank you very much. Oh no, I'm going to stop with that final advert. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes. Sorry, I've gone a little bit longer than that. Yeah. Well, thank you, William. Yeah. Personally, I found it fascinating, and I'm sure everybody else did as well. Um, so we'll start with a, uh, any questions you may have. Um, anybody in the room? Let's start off. Yes. Um, so looking at the work of um, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Professor Matterton and. Um, that's Kerry Howell at Plymouth University. Yeah, Matt's one of my neighbours in Ivy Bridge. So oh, really? I know Matt very well. <laughs> okay. um, well, well we have a project with Matt, actually. This is, this is exactly what I was probably going to say to you, is that he had, um, was that they found a compound at the bottom of the sea that they ran through a protein blast and couldn't actually find, uh, couldn't, couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and then when you were saying there were genes that you didn't know 
necessarily what they did, is there a possibility that you and him might have come across the same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, there's, yeah, I, mean, I spoke to Matt quite a lot about this actually, but the, um, and, and actually part of the project that we're working on with Matt at the moment is, is looking at, so remember when I mentioned you on air, but right at the start, I mentioned different propagation mechanisms, mm. one of them being a latent mechanism. And, and, and quite often when viruses have that kind of latent lifestyle, they, they are still active and they're instrumental in sort of producing a lot of these intermediary compounds yeah. that I think that, that Matt will be sort of seeing. But there's, I mean, we see, it, so the, the EHUX virus genome there, there's about 80% of that genome um, that we have no idea what the genes, are. we know when they're switched on yeah. and when, when they're switched off and you get mass, ma massive parts of the, during the, the virus propagation where they're switched on mm -hmm. and they're producing these metabolites, we don't know what they are. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, with working with people like Matt, who actually looks at that kind of next level, so sort of looking at the metabolites. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, we, we don't have the, the right reference libraries to be able to sort of figure out. So what we need to do is sort of look at functional information. Mm -hmm. So actually so test. So what if we take some of that, we generate the metabolite and see if it has antimicrobial activity, which yeah. is kind of what Matt does. And there's, there was a whole thing because I'm, I'm biomed myself, second year biomed. Right. And, um, and that was the one thing that I, I certainly noticed, not necessarily in comparing kind of like human yeah, and human, the human genome with, with the mouse genome, mm. and you say that there is about 20,000 genes that we know what they do, we've got no idea what the rest of the DNA actually does. Mm. And so I think that we're, we're kind of like seeing a, same, a similar thing in terms of virology, but we're obviously able to see a much kind of like simpler view of that mm. as to that it's producing this, but we don't know why it's producing this or, or what that, yeah. that function is. And now I, 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 I find it fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely, yes. And, and yeah, I mean, I'll tell you what, if I had a fraction of the funds that went into coronavirus research, the oh, this, yes. I, I think we would find out a lot of answers. And that, that just shows you, I mean, you, you take a global pandemic like that mm -hmm. and the money that's thrown at figuring that out yeah. is astronomical in itself. It's incredibly impressive. Um, it, it was the same with HIV research. You know, that, that's a virus that has eight genes mm. and they still don't really, they, they pretty much figure it out, but they, they, this EHV has 500 genes. Mm. <laughs> so what can, you think of, I, I, uh, there was something like there's for every base, basically, so they're looking at base pairs on nucleic mm. acid, for every base pair there's something like 20 scientists working on, uh, on in HIV at one point, it's not so much people, mm. not so many people working on HIV now, but, but yeah, but it, like, it's a matter of scale. Really. And that is, and that is precisely in terms of, in terms of uh, when one looks at, at, at marine biology. So Joanna here is uh, marine biology, second year marine biology. And it's so odd when we kind of like the, see the two intersections of the same thing, and then it's kind of like we, we look at research, with coronavirus, prime example, the amount of money that was thrown at that and you say well the answer might as you say be on our doorstep right in front of us mm -hmm. and yet we're <laughs> overlooking it for yeah with, with other things you know yeah. no that's that's what scientific research is about <laughs> they try to persuade the funders to <laughs> fund it mm -hmm. that's what my career has been um so a grant proposal writing you've got to be good at that so mm -hmm. uh, yeah but the, yeah there's a lot of interest in things there. Do you have any more questions uh, from the floor? Or yes, yes. Sir. Do you have any ideas about the sort of population, if you will, of the viruses? As in, when you get this hundred million or one million, are is it seventy percent of one thing? Oh yeah. Or is it is it and and how is that spatially? So is it like if you if you sample one day to change the next? If you go ten miles down, the, the, is it different again, or is it is it similar? In South Africa or whatever. Yeah. How, really. how, how do, you, do you have any hands on that? If you yeah, we. I mean, we've done a lot of work on that actually. So a lot. Uh, when I first started it, we were developing the diagnostic tools to allow us to answer exactly these types of questions. And 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 the. I mean, the answer is everything you just said. 
I mean, you, you, you can have a situation where, I mean, you take one of these blooms where if it's just crashed caused by these viruses, then probably 90% of what you'll see is all the same virus. Uh, but you, you could go back a week later and that's it's completely different. So if you've got like 100 million viruses in an average, I mean, if I like Plymouth Sound, great example, you go out there, you get say 10 million viruses, so probably about a million different ones. Right, and then you ask the question, well, who are they infecting? Well, there's probably lots of variations on the theme in, in terms of they're probably infecting lots of, uh, of the bacteria that are in there or the, the single cells, the other single cells that are in there, uh, but at very, very low levels. And this is one of the things that we're finding that you, you, it's, it's a dynamic system. And so sometimes you'll get, you'll get really low level infections and, but they can go from that kind of lytic that I talked about, where they can then explode to that very kind of slow moving propagation of chronic and, and latent infections, which are much low level. But it's, it's dynamic. And so we've got a, um, a, a, a study we've done uh, just out in the English Channel here, where we've now we've got, we've been collecting samples for about 20 years. And then we're going to be looking at how just exactly how dynamic it is. So we've got the nucleic acid from 20 years every week for 20 years. And we're just going to be basically probing these samples and asking exactly the questions. But it's, 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 it's quite, I mean, it's a, the, the fundamental part of uh, microbial ecology, actually. And what, and, and, and it, it's, so there's, there's one part is sort of looking at the, the genetics of it, which is what we do in looking at the genetic variation over time. But the difficult bit is translating that into, well, what's the functional meaning of that? So what, why, is it, why is it doing that? And we have a handle on that as well, because there's lots of other data that we collect at the same time. So, I mean, it's a long-winded, well, it's a classic scientific answer is that we do it <laughs> depends, you know, and everything goes uh, yeah. depending on the situation. So I feel that you always asked the same question, which was, if you, I mean, if you went to an ice school that was 100,000 years old, would you recognise the viruses in there to, to what you see now? I mean, is it, or is it that they break down and they start again? Is it, do we not know that, you know, from any evolution? You know, I apply, I, it's funny you say that because uh, I applied to um, thanks, thanks um, uh, for funding to get to an ice core repository to answer exactly that. There's, there's people who have done it with sediment cores, um, and, and and what they see, they see similar things, but it's 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 much more difficult um, because they what they, they tend to break down. It's, it's, the problem. Uh, so they're, they're not as good as say, you know, you get some materials such as cysts, um, biological cysts, which can last a long time. Virus material is, is really difficult. And this is one of the, the Ken Stedman, who I was uh, talking about there, sort of looking for ancient signatures. And it's really difficult to get the ancient uh, signatures. Uh, and I'd love to, uh, I mean, the, the ice cores, I remember getting called by the BBC on exactly that question. And the, but the, the question was that when, the, when you get the Arctic ice cap, when that melts, is it going to end up releasing ancient pandemics? Which is nonsense, but because, you know, I mean, they're talking like hundreds of thousands of years ago when there was hardly any humans on the planet anyway. So, but, um, but a lot of the pandemics, the, a lot of these viruses are, are not that stable, actually. Mm -hmm. um, particularly some, some of the really infectious ones. Um, so they don't tend to last as well. But in that ice course, is something I'd love to get my hands on. Yeah. I believe we've got uh, questions from online participants. Yeah, we've got one here from Lizzie Winters. What is the name of the laser machine used to analyse the viral genome? How does it differ from PCR? All right. Um, so the it's it's called a flow cytometer. So it's uh, yeah. I, I maybe gloss over that very quickly. So we use PCR. But what the laser machine does is actually detect the signature. 
And so we, the sig what the laser does, you shine a laser on a, a flow of water that contains viruses in it. Uh, and each of these viruses, which is stained with that fluorescent stain, there's two parameters that you're looking at, the level of fluorescence and the size of the particle. And you get a scatter plot, and then you just have to say to the laser, uh, what I want you to do is deflect the particle within that group, and it puts it into a pot. Eppendorf mm tube. -hmm. Um, and then we use PCR to, or there's PCRs, one of the downstream methods that we use. So it's very different. It's a difference between a mechanism for grabbing the virus to a separate mechanism, which is sequencing the virus. Part of that process is through PCR. Yeah. 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 So that, I rushed over that bit right at the end. So I was well picked up on there. Thanks for the question. Yeah. You um, you described the uh, the cyclical blooms, which uh, you, you you've been looking at there, which are a normal part of the um, the, the cycle of of life and death in the ocean. Um, when these blooms get out of control, um, they they affect the whole ecosystem. They also uh, affect the albedo of the ocean as well, don't they? Mm -hmm. uh, so do you have much crossover between um, your field of study and um, the, the the study of climate change? Um, do you get involved in that very much? or do you... uh, The short answer is yes. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the long answer is we so probably some of the early research that I did, we were sort of looking at, well, I, so I, I used to give a talk on how viruses control the weather mm -hmm. uh, and impact climate. Mm -hmm. And there's kind of long, so there's uh, something called uh, the claw hypothesis, which is sort of looking at how, um, I mean, that, that's part of sort of wider Gaia theory where the, the kind of planet is a self-regulating mm -hmm. organism if you want to call it that, but you can imagine a situation where, and it, it, we kind of skipped over it in the, the animation and the, the video, where um, during the infection, you get um, a biogenic sulfur gas called dimethyl sulfide that's released. And actually dimethyl sulfide is, I mean, the smell of the ocean mm. is that you get that kind of slight sulfurous, nice mm. sulfurous smell not hydrogen sulfide, mm. but dimethyl sulfide, which is the smell of the ocean. Now, when that fluxes into the atmosphere, when you get one of these big blooms, you get a huge flux of this, and that is oxidized into acidic particles in the upper atmosphere, mm -hmm. which form cloud condensation nuclei. Mm. Okay, and that increases the, the albedo in, in terms of the cloud albedo, so you get more reflectance. So if you get, you need a lot of sunlight. So in simple terms, you, get, you need a lot of sunlight that creates algal blooms that are then killed by viruses that release this, that form clouds that then prevent the sunlight. So it's a kind of mm. feedback system. Yeah. Um, so there was a, a lot of hypothesis around that, but the missing link in that whole hypothesis was how do you get such a big flux Mm. And we we published paper. We published some quite high profile papers way back in the mm -hmm. late nineties around this. Um, mm. So yeah, but in terms of the climate change, which is actually a slightly different issue, I'm talking about weather there rather than climate. Uh, with climate change, we look at the the kind of long term impacts of climate change, mm. and part of something I kind of glossed over very quickly right during the introduction is the, the, a lot of the long-term studies that we do. So we have plankton studies that we've been running for 90 years, over 90 years now. Some of the work we do in the English Channel has been running for over 100 years now in terms of sort of fisheries assessments. Mm -hmm. um, Rocky Shore studies, sort of look at, we've been looking at that for over 60 years. I just mentioned a 20-year study and there you can actually, when you sort of put all that data together, you can start sort of looking at impacts of climate change. So the, there's all the climate change models, and you can align all that with real biological data. 
and you can see the patterns. We see shifts, thousand kilometer shifts in plankton yes. in the some moving northwards. So you get warm water plankton that move north, sort of pushing some of the and this has massive impacts on the ecosystem because you you have a lot of the colder water species that are much more lipid rich mm -hmm. and really important for some of the commercial fisheries. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a big knock-on effect there. And viruses play a role in all of that as well. But uh, mm. but yeah, but yeah, and that so that's a slightly longer answer. I can give a little longer <laughs> answer. <laughs> actually, but, yeah, but um, I, I mean, it does show the interconnectedness absolutely. of um, of all these processes mm. um, that, that are taking place in the ocean and the rest of the world as well. Um, I, I mean, the reduction in the ice caps. Um, besides having this effect of releasing perhaps um, ancient viruses um, in, into the ocean uh, also has that effect on climate with increasing, uh, it, it, reducing the, the reflective nature or reflectiveness of the, yes. of the earth as a whole, yes. isn't it? Yes. And, 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 you know, you then get into feedback loops. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a, a, a sort of self-generating um, process. Mm. And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where you get into a, a lot of the sort of Gaian theory mm. around all of that. And it's, it's something I, I mean, I, I love all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's and, and 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 again, we can demonstrate how viruses play an integral role in all of that as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we, yeah, I mean, we actually, uh, from what I read, we actually know a lot less about what goes on in the oceans, uh, in, in particularly in certain parts of, you know, deeper parts of the ocean. We're only exploring the surface really at the moment mm -hmm. um, than we do about what's happening in space, mm -hmm. the immediate space around us. Um, well, they say, yeah, they say we know more about the surface of the moon than the, yeah, the bottom the, of the ocean. So, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I guess we've got another online question. Yeah, and another online question from Eric. Is there any implication of the discovery virophage, virophage on the field of astrovirology and how much the impact of viral infection in the microalgal species succession in the ocean compared with environmental condition? Yes, uh, yeah, that, that's not an easy answer to that. So, that, that, so I have, a, I, there's a separate talk that I give looking at virophage. So virophage is basically a virus that infects a virus. So I didn't even talk about that. That's a really interesting system. So we have a system that we've isolated and it's, um, it, we, we sort of look at that. And actually what we, we have this just, bonkers system where it's a single cell coccolithophore um, that's infected by three separate viruses and it actually it improves the health of the, the cell the, the cell is mm -hmm. we're kind of working all this data up at the moment um, so it, it actually gives a kind of a selective advantage to the to the uh, to the microalgae itself so you have a, an infection system inside. So you have a, a large DNA virus, which normally would kill the cell. We, we know these, the particular group of viruses will kill the cell, but it also has this, this virophage. That's a, something called a polytonin, uh, which is just a, a, a different, it's, it's within the same group as virophages uh, that actually inhibit the infection. And when that infection is inhibited, there's a single stranded uh, DNA infection that happens as, as part of that. Now these are incredibly robust cells and we think in the, in the ocean that they have kind of low turnover rates but they're, but they're incredibly <laughs> robust. Um, and we, we published a um, paper on this uh, last year actually. Right? Well, one last year and one this, this year. I know there was other aspects of that question I, I missed but is, 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 I guess the overall impact on the ocean and how it, yeah. It's a great question, <laughs> absolutely brilliant question. And I could bang on about that one for a long time because 
the video phage, uh, I, I mean, here we talk about viruses and that, and then it's, it's, it's only recently been discovered that you get viruses that infect other viruses. Mm -hmm. Not in the true right. infection sense, but so it's a slightly different mechanism. Yeah. That's another one for another day. Huh? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I love it. I, I've got, I do a good talk on that. Yeah. We've got about 10 minutes left before they take us out. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? Yes. yes. Um, one is a question. It might sound slightly trivial, but in terms of in our lifetime, in, I doubt we'll find a little green mountain, but do you think we will find a little green slime? Mm. In our lifetime? No. Mm. I, I don't I don't think so. Uh, it's I think the 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 technical challenges are massive. Mm. I mean when you when you see the and, and the scale of it all is is, is massive as well. I, I remember seeing oh the, the analogy of just looking at the distance between you know, to get probes to all these places. Mm -hmm. Remember, but, well, I, again, you went here at the start, but the, you, 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 these Goldilocks zone planets, mm -hmm. and, and it's, it's going to take them 100,000 years to get here for us to get there. <laughs> so the, we, we need some, the, the, the scaling needs to change. Now, will we find something? The, the, there is, I mean, I mean, there are, I mean, you keep, every, every now and then you sort of hear about, uh, I mean, you're going to need water of some sort yeah. for any kind of life, really, unless you sort of go into the realms of inorganic life, mm. which is a whole other issue mm. uh, or a whole other topic, really. Um, but I, I, I don't know. I mean, I... Remember they said Eagle 2 to Mars, and, that they, and then by the time they got there, they just like lost all contact with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the thing. And until the technology gets, I mean, you say it within our lifetime, I mean, lifetimes, mm -hmm. but the technology is going to change. They've got to figure mm -hmm. out how to get these vast distances mm -hmm. well, in much. Get, we'd, we'd be happy just for Titan or somewhere, you know, one of the moons. Yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe, maybe Titan, maybe Europa. We or... How many in there? Yeah, for the human atmosphere. Yeah. And there's, I mean, this is, well, the, uh, the, uh, the workshop I was at with um, NASA, that was Europa, they were talking about so this. Yeah. Um, that's one of the moons of, is it Venus? Is it Europa is Saturn? Yeah. Saturn. Yeah. I can't remember now. Yeah, yeah. I should know that. And, yeah, yeah. Google it quick. Yeah. 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 Europa, I know they were going on about it. Was, yeah. it it's a place where there, there's mm. a possibility. Well, there's still extreme environments there, but there's possibility. The ocean, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're talking about the possibility of hydrogen cycle. We're not talking about the next galaxy. We're talking about yeah. this one. Yeah. yeah. We That's were all wrong. It was Jupiter. <laughs> Jupiter. Of course it's yeah. Jupiter. Yeah. yeah, of course it's Jupiter. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. You're thinking about the. the uh, this possibility of life based on hydrocarbons rather than yeah. carbon and oxygen. Yeah, yeah, and and that's the, and I, th I think there will be something there. I mean, that it, it's but it, yeah. Io as well has mm, that's uh, right. Yeah, has via uh, geysers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. strange. Oh, uh, moon. Yeah, yeah. Had, <laughs> so so you kind of have that combination of temperature and and, and water. And, and, and one starts to think, well, is, is, is the missing ingredient there mm. to have that spark of, yeah. mm, of life? But it, I, I mean, the whole area is, is fascinating. But you, sometimes you've got to ask yourself, is it really worth the investment that goes into mm. some, of the, some of these projects? Mm. Um, and I, 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 I find myself horrified saying that as a research scientist sometimes mm -hmm. but I, I just think you know it's just the example of you go to Plymouth Sound but there's stuff there we have no mm -hmm. idea about I mean we, <coughs> but, but yeah but it's there's always there's always been this fascination isn't mm -hmm. there so and I think as long as there's that fascination there'll always be a you know you'll get your I mean people like Elon Musk who will uh, We'll figure out a way somehow because he'll be able to throw that much uh, if he's own funding at it. Um, but, but yeah, it's fascinating.
And in a few billion years' time, humankind will have to move off this planet before it floods. Yeah. Probably, probably a few decades' time, I should think. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. Another. Yeah. Okay. Fine. If it, no further questions, then I'll thank you very much again, Willie. Um, I'm sure you'd all like to give uh, Willie uh, another round of applause for a fascinating. <laughs>